Well, good morning. My name is Dr. Sharla Johnson. I am a registered nurse, and I practice the art and science of nursing in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I serve the uh, mission of the Franciscan, Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System uh, across two states, in Louisiana and Mississippi. I am so excited to be able to introduce our next speakers. Because a healthy city is one that protects and enhances the well-being of its greatest assets, its citizens, I am very pleased to present Mayor President of the City of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Sharon Weston Broom, and a dear friend and nurse colleague, Coletta Barrett. Mayor Broom is the first female Mayor President of the City of Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish. She previously served as a Baton Rouge Mayor Baton Rouge Metro City Council member, a Louisiana State Representative, and a Louisiana State Senator. While serving in the legislature, Broom became the first woman to hold both leadership positions of Speaker Pro Tem in the House and President Pro Tem in the Senate. Since taking office in 2017, Mayor Broom has placed a heavy focus on improving the quality of life for citizens while building resiliency through promoting a culture of health throughout East Baton Rouge Parish. Through her Healthy City Initiative, or Healthy BR, she has helped facilitate two joint community health needs assessments and joint community health implementation plans between the five local area nonprofit hospitals. So I would have to say in the Baton Rouge Parish, it would be those five local families <laughs> that Dr. Riley mentioned in New York. Galetta Barrett is the chairman of the board for the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Colette serves as the president of Mission for Our Lady of the Lake Regional Medical Center, the flagship hospital for the Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System. She is a graduate of Southeastern Louisiana University School of Nursing and the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Coletta is both a fellow of the American Heart Association as well as the American College of Healthcare Executives. She has served in many volunteer leadership roles over her 45 years of clinical and administrative healthcare leadership. Help me welcome them to the next session. Well, Mayor Broom, welcome. Well, it's a delight to be here. I have been looking forward to this experience for quite some time now. Me too, me too. And, and in our introductions, Charlotte did such a wonderful job. Is there anything about the introduction that you want to add? Well, I think she covered a whole lot of territory <laughs> there in that introduction. Uh, I will just say that uh, over half of my life has been involved as a uh, public servant. And certainly being the uh, mayor president, um, of course, you know, we have parishes in uh, uh, Louisiana. And so I'm the mayor of the city of Baton Rouge and the president of the parish. Uh, that has certainly been uh, one of my best experiences during my journey of public service. And I will say that I certainly enjoy being a wife to Marvin Broom and a mother to three children and three marvelous grandchildren. Yeah. She's a busy lady. She's a very busy lady. And Charlotte's introduction, you know, I want to add, Dr. Riley, that Our Lady of the Lake is one of those public-private partnerships. We stepped forward as the safety net for Baton Rouge when um, Earl K. Long closed back in 2013. And so assuming that role um, was very, very important to the sisters' ministry. And yes, the nuns say, no mission, no margin, because we believe that's what drives a margin. And of course, our finance guy says, no margin, we can't fund your mission. <laughs> so they're very, very interdependent, and we're very glad. And as Mayor said, or as Sharla said, the five hospitals in Baton Rouge are not considered the ruling families. We are part of a collaborative. And so um, we're here today to kind of share our story um, with you. Now, in your packet, you saw the introduction is uh, public-private partnerships creating a culture of health. So you may ask yourself why we have this public gumbo. Um, and I think that we're here to tell you a little bit about why what happens in Baton Rouge is like a recipe. Absolutely. 
I don't know how many of you all have ever had gumbo in Louisiana, but let me just tell you, we created the best gumbo in the whole world. <laughs> gumbo is part of the fabric of our state and our community. And what we love about a gumbo, Coletta, is that in that gumbo you have, now I, I prefer seafood gumbo, right, because I'm a pescatarian. But in that gumbo you have all these different ingredients. You have the seafood, you have the shrimp, you have the crab meat, you have the roux, you have the sausage, et cetera. And none of those ingredients lose their flavor, but they all work together collaboratively to make one of the best, most outstanding dishes known internationally. And that's how we look at the work that we do with our public-private partnerships. And that public-private partnership that Mayor talks about, that recipe, um, is represented in the work of Healthy BR, which is the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative. This is a not-for-profit 501c3 that was established in 2010. Although back in 2007, the then mayor um, requested that we do a listening tour to find out what do we need to do to become a healthier city. And through that listening tour with over 42 different entities, not-for-profit organizations um, across the community, we presented a, a plan that said, we have, great not, we have great philanthropy, we have great people committed to doing good work, but we don't coordinate our work, we don't collaborate with our work, we don't, uh, it's not organized, it's every man on their own. So we recommended that the mayor create this opportunity for all of these not-for-profits to come together to focus on the health of our city. We do not have a public health, uh, local public health department. And so we envisioned stepping into that space when called upon and needed. So thankfully, the 2010 Affordable Care Act required not-for-profit hospitals to have a community health needs assessment and do that every three years. And so in 2012, when the first CHNA was done, it was a collaborative CHNA where all of the meat of the program or all the ingredients of the gumbo were there, but each entity had to write their own. Fast forward to 2015 when we requested, why can't we do a joint CHNA? We all agree on the same market. We meet all the requirements for the IRS and we have a single implementation plan for all of us. And it was like the IRS rules weren't quite written by then, but the Catholic Health Association said, you know, if you're doing the right thing, they're gonna catch up. We know it's coming. So Baton Rouge, we did the first joint CHNA and produced the first joint implementation plan. And that work was recognized by the American Hospital Association with an ANOVA award. Um, it's the first time that the Hospital Association recognized an entity outside of hospitals. And so of course, all the five hospital CEOs got to go to San Francisco and get their award. But then Rich Umdenstock, who was a CEO then, flew to Baton Rouge and presented the mayor of Baton Rouge with the same award because of the work that the mayor had done to convene. And so through this time in 2015, social determinants of health were considered one of the five top priorities with a focus of hospitals looking at social determinants. It was pretty interesting, the conversation about social determinants because hospitals were like, well, we do diabetes clinics or we do these types of clinics. And the question was, that's too far down the line. So how do we get in front of this? And we asked him three questions. Do you hire people? Do you buy stuff? And do you make investments? And when they all said yes, it's like now you understand the foundation of addressing social determinants. And so that's been a part of the work that you'll hear about with the mayor. And then in 2021, as we prepare for this next joint community health needs assessment, Health equity is the lens with which that same work is being discussed. So Mayor, I'm not a cook. Everybody will tell you I can dial up and get it delivered. But Mayor, you are the cook. So bring us through what the gumbo is. Well, I'm the cook of Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish. But if you ask my husband, he's the cook in the house. But I will tell you some of the key ingredients is ingredients of our gumbo 
of public-private partnerships. Of course, we believe that uh, we all have a common agenda. So we are in alignment, our government, the mayor's office, with our five hospitals in terms of what the goals are to build a healthier city in Baton Rouge. And that community health needs assessment has helped us drive our agenda because we believe that our agenda certainly has to be based on data. And uh, that is what the community health needs assessment provides for us. Also, accountability is part of a, uh, a great collaborative public-private partnership. Uh, we make sure that every uh, T is crossed, every I is dotted. Uh, we make sure that everything is in order and when perhaps government is not working at the pace that we should in this collaborative, then our private uh, partners uh, hold us accountable and vice versa. When we feel that our hospitals are not uh, meeting the needs or if there's a gap with our common agenda, then we reach out to them and share that. Of course, I am so fortunate that even though we do not have a health department, that I have an exceptional team in my office that really offers the backbone support of our Healthy BR program, which is a nonprofit uh, group. And of course, uh, leadership. You know, everything rises and falls on leadership. And for me, Healthy BR is one of my top priorities. Uh, addressing the social determinants of health through a lens uh, uh, of health equity is one of my uh, priorities. And through these relationships that we've built over the years with our private partners, we've been able to elevate the trust with uh, the private community and uh, government. And of course, keeping the lines of communication fluid and open is another essential ingredient for a successful public private gumbo. Thank you, Mayor. And so what I would share with, uh, with you all about this, this collective impact model, I mean, these are the tenets of, of collective impact. And we know that collective impact ensures long-term uh, large-scale change, and it is sustainable over time. And so making sure that each one of these aspects that the Mayor outlined or where we as a board focus in supporting the efforts that are, that are laid out. And you know, sustainability with um, meetings and looking at the agendas and making sure that we're achieving the numbers um, help us figure out where we need to go next. And so we've talked about this you know, community health needs assessment. I kind of think that it would be important for you all to know that while the community health needs assessment is a snapshot in time, it, it drives our direction for the next three years. And so that becomes part of the mayor's platform and what she produces and what she talks about in the community. Um, and so the implementation plans are the yearly ways we go about achieving those. And so that's where you get the flexibility, that's where you get the accountability, that's where you get the measurements and the systems that we put in place. And what we've done, the mayor's done a phenomenal job of making sure that we do have these data systems. Um, you know, in, in the early days, what was it, BR City Key? Yes, yeah, but we've come a long way. Absolutely, <laughs> now there are publicly reported databases that That's have right. all of this information. And so it's really very, very important that we look at data. So what we wanted to share with you now is that we talk about what the community health needs assessment is and the implementation plans but nothing does like showing the picture. That's right. When I took office in 2017, our community had experienced one of the most difficult years in the history of Baton Rouge. Our people, myself included, were recovering from the historic 2016 flood. Our community also faced the shooting of Alton Sterling and the loss of three officers who were ambushed in the line of duty. These events impacted our city in many different ways and demanded a holistic response. In response, I set out with a vision for Baton Rouge to be a place of peace, prosperity, and progress. Creating a healthier city was a key component of that vision. 
The health and well-being of our citizens is vitally important to the success of our community. At the same time, we knew we could not do it alone. We needed to bring together stakeholders from across our community to help make Baton Rouge a healthier place for all. This is why in November of 2017, we brought together over 100 people from different communities, organizations, and walks of life. We called it the Baton Rouge Vision of Health 2021. Here we came together to discuss the health needs of our communities and ways that we can address them. We heard from subject matter experts, but we also wanted to hear from the community. So we partnered with our library system and over 600 residents told us what they thought were the most important health needs. Then finally, we met with our own Healthy VR medical group to get feedback from them. When this process was over, we identified four focus areas. Healthy living, behavioral health, sexually transmitted infections and HIV, and access to care. Then through Healthy VR, we began our journey to bring together over 100 organizations and 400 members of our community to address these health needs. As you can see, there was so much amazing work that was done these past three years, but we still have so much more to do. As we move into 2021, we look forward to hearing from each of you about what you think are the most important health needs in our community. It's going to take each of us working together to create a community of peace, prosperity, and progress so that we all one day create a healthier community for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm extremely, I, I tell Colette all the time, you know, I have my hands in a lot of different things as mayor president, but I am extremely proud of the work of Healthy BR especially when you think about the fact that we do not have a health department and the work that we're able to put out. But let's talk a little bit about, uh, when I came in office, uh, we hired a new leader of Healthy BR. And the young man that I interviewed started talking about the social determinants of health. I said, oh, he gets it, he gets it. I was so excited and he got hired too. <laughs> because so many times people don't look at the holistic approach to health and, and so many people, uh, now it's become more relevant to a lot of uh, groups, but they don't get the impact of the social determinants of health. And so we started making that part of our guiding light. Of course, it was part of our uh, community health implementation plan. So one of the things that we did is that we continue to build partnerships. We looked at the landscape of our community. So for example, in one of our communities of disinvestment, um, there was a medical building, medical center that had been established by some doctors in our area, but it had gone out of business. It had been empty for 15 years. So my team started reaching out to some partners about how can we put this back into commerce and how can we use it as a tool to close the health equity gap, right? So we started reaching out to different individuals and uh, we found some folks on the commercial real estate end who, wanted, who, who were in line with our vision and they said, okay, we'll help you with it. Then we saw, so we touched some people in the medical community. I don't know if I ever told you this story, Colette, about how I was at a luncheon with the president of Oshner. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said to me, he said, what can I do to help you? And I said, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> we have a building that we're trying to stand up a, a health center in. Uh, and so fast forward, we now have what is known as How Place. We put that 15 year empty building back into commerce and now it has a primary uh, care uh, center there as a result of my conversation with the president of Oshner. It now has a behavioral health center uh, there. We have an ophthalmologist there. And so we have put, and we're creating jobs. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the, so we're creating a thriving economy in an area of disinvestment with our 
Howell Place project. So I'm very proud of that. Of course, our work is expanding across our community. Um, now we have Baton Roots Community Farm, which was established with another, a nonprofit. Remember, we're talking about partnerships here. This nonprofit, the Walls Project, is usually involved in a lot of the arts development in our community, but they have broadened because their mission is to eradicate poverty in our community. And so that they have uh, partnered with LSU, and now the Walls Project and LSU have come up with Baton Roots Community Farm. And so now we have community people who are building uh, gardens, we have students who are building gardens, and we're teaching our community members the valuable lessons uh, that are involved in agriculture. And so, of course, one of my favorites, move with the mayor. We're gonna tell you a lot about that a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I uh, decided that um, I have my own personal health journey that I'll tell you about before we finish today. Uh, but move with the mayor is a involvement of the mayor leading by example, practicing what she preaches, and going out in the community. And uh, we have not only uh, exercise that takes place throughout the community in a lot of different shapes and forms, so many, I'll have to tell you about them. Uh, but we also focus, of course, on family-friendly events. And last but not least, our Safe, Hopeful, and Healthy initiative is one of our uh, ways that we are looking at violence through the lens and public safety through the lens of health and are working to address our public safety issues keeping the lens of health at the forefront. And, and you know, as the mayor talked about the different, um, you know, uh, partners throughout, uh, I want to share with you some additional ones. You know, the important, the important thing about sustainable change over time is not that you set something in place and you expect the community to come to you. It's important that you understand and know the community and you go to the community. And so, the mayor, with her economic development group, brought Dollar General to the table. Dollar General is all across our community, and they are specifically in communities of needs. Communities, zip codes, and neighborhoods that have a need index are greater than 4.2, and they are there. So imagine their receptivity when we said, can we talk about how you reprogram what you provide in Dollar General? Can you bring fresh and healthier to the forefront? And so they piloted it in a couple, you know, and they were like, dang, this, is, this stuff is good. And so now there's this long-term plan of re, whenever they go in to rehabilitate or refresh a Dollar General, they pull and bring fresh and healthy to the forefront. So, you know, once again, it's an example. We identified local grocery stores, the corner grocery stores, where you go get your beer and your cigarettes. We talked to them and said, can you put fresh and healthy up front? So through the mayor's office, they put grants in place so that these little corner grocery stores could buy refrigeration so they could bring the products in closer to front. Once again, going where people go. Just a few of those. Um, you know, Dr. Riley talked about the policy, you know, lens to look at things. So the... Um, the food access panel, the you know policy commission is what we call it, you know, giving guidelines of where we need to go over the next five to ten years is really very very important. And the last thing that I will share with you is that, you know, talking about the wealth gap, how you address social determinants from an economic platform is critical. So one of the members of our board is the Baton Rouge area chamber, and so the chamber presidents, the mayor, you know, what do you need me to do? Well, you need to get economics going. You need to get more procurement for small women, veteran-owned businesses, local businesses. Figure out how we can scale and get them more business so that we can lift the economics of our community up. So be our pop. Yeah, and, and let me just add, uh, Coletta, you know, when I came into office, there was a hue and cry from the community, especially communities of color, about the lack of connectivity with the um, government and also partners throughout our, our community. So equity and inclusion became a pillar of my administration. And it wasn't just in one area, it was in all areas. And so when we talk about 
uh, public health and our connections to the uh, health community, equity and inclusion vibrates there as well. Yeah, social justice is one yes. of the cornerstones. And so we've talked about that, but let's see what it looks like in Baton Rouge. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to 1000 North 23rd Street, Capitol High School. My name is Courtney Bell, and I have the privilege of being the school leader here at Capitol High. Through the Hustle and Grow program under the Mayor's Go Get Healthy initiative, we have been able to show students that community nutrition and wellness is a social justice cause worth getting behind. Since 2018, the Go Get Healthy initiative has worked with community partners to address food insecurity and food deserts within regions of our parish with the highest rates of food insecurity and health disparities. And so through the partnership with Healthy BR and the Go Get Healthy Coalition, Baton Roots is honored to be part of this work on addressing food insecurity in the capital region. And so it's extremely important when initiatives like this take place to teach our young people how to plant, how to farm, and how to create opportunities for access to healthy food. We are grateful for the vision of Mayor Broom to launch the Healthy BR Initiative, her administration's holistic approach to health and wellness in our city, and particularly in traditionally underserved communities, is an exemplar for communities across the country. If you take a man to fish, you can feed him for a day. But if you teach a man how to farm, we can feed the community forever. And so my hope and desire would be that we're able to feed our communities forever. So yeah. that's how you see it in action. That's right. <laughs> and I will tell you that uh, our Go Get Healthy initiative is now going to other schools throughout our community. So we're making it part of our education landscape as well. And, and for the medical professionals in here, you know, it's a multi-phase program. I'm gonna share with you, it's the, the whole art of collaboration. The Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation and the Humana Foundation, two competing health plan foundations, came together to fund the Go Get Healthy initiative. Remember, we talked about collaboration and trust as a cornerstone of what we do. And it's not just with the five competing hospitals. It's also with health plans. We, the mayor, has created a platform where we bring competitors together in the spirit of collaboration. We've coined it in Baton Rouge, coopetition. <laughs> we will collaborate and cooperate like crazy where public health is, but we're gonna compete like heck when it comes to market share. <laughs> but in the spirit of coopetition, here's where we find ourselves. And so it's really, really very important that, that you understand that it's not just, um, it's really the, the culture of health. It's um, when the mayor hired her, her per, you know, J Jared, <laughs> Jared Heimowitz, um, she said, health in all oh, policies. So we look at zoning and planning and where's the health in that policy. We look at joint use agreements and where's the health in that policy. So when you take the National League of Cities roadmap of policy and you look at where you implement it in a health lens, we can make phenomenal things happen. And that's where we are. So Mayor, you know, focusing food insecurity is, you know, a long-term play and something that you get a lot of partners to the table with. Talk to us about the impact that COVID-19 has had um, on our community and um, with our public health infrastructure. Yeah, um, I don't have to tell you that uh, for many cities, um, local governments were not designed to handle a pandemic. I'll just tell you that. Uh, but because we had the infrastructure, if you will, of uh, our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative, uh, when we first started hearing about COVID-19 and the coronavirus, we convened all of our hospitals, all of our five hospitals came together around the table to talk about strategy and how we as a community uh, would start addressing uh, the coronavirus. Uh, at that time, there was no testing taking place, no test sites. And so we didn't have any federal dollars, we didn't have any state dollars or, lo or local dollars. As I said, local government wasn't designed to handle a pandemic. Uh, but what we did through the leadership of the mayor's office and our five hospitals, 
we came together and we said, we're not going to wait for somebody to give us some money to do this. So all of our five hospitals donated tests. All of our five hospitals stood up the first drive-through testing site in the state of Louisiana. All of our five hospitals had their staff volunteer and rotate days out where they would do testing. And it is because of that collaboration and relationship that we've had with them uh, through our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative that we were able to offer a response uh, when COVID-19 first emerged in our community. And I will tell you, as you all know, that the coronavirus has certainly elevated the awareness of health disparities that exist throughout our country. And so we made sure after we did that first drive-through free testing site that we targeted through our health equity commission that we um, developed, that we targeted those areas where there were gaps in terms of testing. So, for example, the uh, hospital that Colette works for, uh, they have a clinic in, that, in an area of disinvestment. They started offering test. Then other hospitals started broadening and enlarging their territory of offering uh, tests. Then we started mobile units. But it all started, our response all started with a convening of our five committed area hospitals who said we're going to collaborate, work together to make this happen and offer a response. It was it was a really scary time, and um, most all of our institutions really didn't have everything that we needed. But collectively, we could put it together um, to be able to respond. And and what drove a lot of that conversation was that that whole shining a light on the inequity. Uh, in the early days, seventy five percent of the deaths um, in our hospitals were of um, people of color, and that kind of raised a real alarm as to what and why. And, and then we plotted where um, people lived and found out that most of these were in disinvested communities, like I said, with a need index of greater than 4.2, which then really raised the question. And that's when the mayor said, time out, we need a health equity lens on this. And that's when the health equity um, commission was put in place. And very, very, very important work. And, and you know, there's some positive things that came out of, of, of the pandemic as far as long-term change. Um, but, you know, we still have a, a long way to go yet. I, 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 one of the things that, that you were most passionate about when you came into office was looking at HIV. Would you take us on that journey yeah. of what, why, and how, and now? Well, um, I took office in 2017, but I had, as I shared with you, been in public service for quite some time. And I kept hearing about the uh, number of HIV and AIDS cases we had in our city and our community. And I kept hearing about this ranking that we were number one in AIDS cases in the nation. Number one, and that kept, it just stuck with me. So when I became mayor, I said, one of the first things we've got to do is address this number one ranking of AIDS in our community. And through working with our hospitals uh, and making it a priority and giving voice to the fact that this is not acceptable for our community, we started changing the trajectory. Um, you know, we started doing opt-out testing in our hospitals. We started talking about it. I signed agreements with other mayors across the nation that we were committed to reducing that number. But most importantly, we started taking the stigma away from HIV and AIDS in our community. And that meant that I was everywhere with everyone giving voice to it as a priority for me as a leader in our community. So since I've been in office, with the help of our partners and my team, and we have moved from one to 10. Now we've got a lot of work to do, but we're not number one anymore. In three years, in three, in three years. years yeah. that's, a long, that's a major change for public health in just three years. 
And so, you know, with that work, Mayor, it's, you know, we often talk about um, focusing on um, the inequitable distribution of care. And so um, one of the things that, that I wanted to highlight and maybe amplify is the holistic approach that you take to not only public health and the health of our community, um, but our own personal journeys. And so would you, uh, w one of the things that, oh, I do wanna highlight this. I think it was really very important. When we were talking about, a, we were talking about uh, the pandemic mm -hmm. and going to disinvested communities, one of the things that we identified in our community is that we have a very strong faith. Oh yeah. A very strong faith. Our, our black churches, our brown churches um, are very strong. It's a fabric of our community. And so partnering with our pastors was another one of our ways that we did outreach besides the testing yes. and vaccinations in, in the clinics. We worked with our pastors and went to churches. We did information sessions. We hosted vaccine clinics yes. in their church halls, um, mobile in the parking lots of churches in order to get past the stigma, the stigma of research yeah. and vaccinations in brown communities. Yeah. And so once again, this whole thing of identifying your partners, your stakeholders, how do you create trust or how do you use referent trust to move an agenda forward? That's all part of a fabric. Yeah, yeah. I would be remiss. I'm so glad you brought that up because uh, in Louisiana and many places in the South, the faith community plays a very active role uh, in the development of our uh, community. And I will tell you, I had pastors uh, calling me left and right, I want a testing site. What can you do? We want to do a, vac a vaccination event, you know? Uh, so, and that was welcomed because when we talk about closing the gaps, we've got churches all over the fabric of our community. And so they served as uh, outreach uh, centers and they were part of the equation of us uh, addressing uh, the pandemic. And they still are, they're very, very active in uh, what we're doing. Yeah, your, the, the event that you hosted that brought, the, you know, many of the religious leaders across the community, that's not a new thing. See, one of the things that, you, that we want to share with you about being prepared in an emergency and as a pandemic, that is not the time to try and build yeah. a relationship. <laughs> that is not the time, guys. You have to build that over time with trust. When people understand how you make decisions, the reasoning that you put into it, and you build that collective trust, that's what steps forward to give you the infrastructure and the foundation you need when something bad happens. And so, you know, the years that the mayor put into creating this coalition, to creating this collaborative, or what gave us that foundation, and then what continues even to today when our numbers are down, we only have in our institution, we had over 250 patients that were COVID at one time, and now we're down to like less than 20. And um, it's, you know, we're on that downside, but yet the medical community still meets on Monday nights at five o'clock. We have a conference call. And during the height of the pandemic, it was every night at five o'clock. And then it went to twice a week and then once a week. And it was all the medical directors from the hospitals, administration from the hospitals, and the mayor's staff talking about what's happened today, what do we need to be prepared for tomorrow. And that group agreed on things like, visitation policies, how we had the same visitation policy across all five hospitals in the community. It had um, uh, visitation, we had things like treatment protocols. You know, what seems to be working? What do we need to do different? You know, like, okay, everybody try proning, don't do anything else. Don't put them on ventilators until you try X, Y, and Z. I mean, sharing collective wisdom and treatment protocols on a daily and weekly basis to get in front of this. And so those are the things that are even still today. Yeah, I wanted to say, you talked about collective wisdom. Um, you all have uh, heard so many different stories about government leaders during the pandemic. And I will tell you that I based my decisions not on uh, political popularity during the pandemic, but I leaned in to my medical community. I leaned into the data 
and that is how I made my decision. I remember my first decision was uh, in 2020, was when the- March. It, March of 2020, when we had two big events scheduled that weekend. Uh, one was the St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day, Day Parade, <laughs> and another was some uh, rap concert. I can't remember the rapper, but it were two big events that everybody was looking forward to. And I convened with the medical community. I'm like, hey, you know, what do you all think about this? And the overall feedback was not a good idea, potential for a super spreader. So what I did though, I called those groups in. I told them how I got to my decision. And I said, we need to cancel for the greater good of the entire city and parish. Uh, so that is how I made my decisions, not only then, but throughout the pandemic, leaning in to the data and the feedback and wise counsel I got from the medical community. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you can't underplay the communication. You spoke to that initially about so important, so important. And that spirit of transparency was what the mayor brought to those really, really hard conversations. You know, Mardi Gras had just happened yeah. and people were really looking forward to St. Patrick's Day. The, 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 the transparency with which you, you know, bringing people to the table, having the physicians dial into the phone call to say, we're the one that told her no. <laughs> we're the one that said, we don't think it's a good idea. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a reciprocal relationship and um, those scientists still weigh in. Now we talked about how the impact to disinvested communities were so significant, but it also takes a personal toll on people. I would like for you to share with the group here about Nurse Brown. Oh yeah. Many of you all may have seen Nurse Brown because she's been on, she's our national rock star all, all over the screen on TV. But uh, during the pandemic, uh, Nurse Carla Brown, who works for a hospice organization, um, she got COVID and uh, she took it home and her husband uh, contracted COVID and he died. And uh, no, Nurse Brown, Carla Brown, became an advocate uh, for the vaccine. She talked about her own personal story on our, uh, with our local media, but even more than that, she was determined to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So she started going door to door, but before she went door to door, she needed some vaccine. <laughs> so she came to me and others. She went to one of our local uh, uh, pharmacies and uh, asked them if they could help. And then one day I was there talking with her. She's like, Mayor, can you help me? So I kind of gave uh, our Department of Public Health a little nudge and said, we need to help Nurse Brown, because this lady is going all over the community. Not only is she willing to give the vaccine, but she's advocating, she's telling her story. She's dismantling some of the myths and rumors that are out there. So she has made a profound impact in terms of getting vaccinations out to our community. And after she did that, then we started uh, having our EMS department go out and go door to door for those people who couldn't get out uh, and give the vaccine out. But she is a premier example of uh, embracing an issue and becoming uh, an advocate for it in a very pronounced way. Nurse Carla Brown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very much an advocate yeah. for the patient. Some of you all may have seen her on TV before. She's, she's been on every TV show you can, yeah. So, um, but it's about how one person can make a significant yes, right. difference, a significant mm -hmm. difference. And so talking about personal journeys, talking about individual contributions, you know, et cetera. Mayor, you know, how is, is your own personal journey um, the base of your gumbo. Yeah, you know, when my team came uh, to me with our Go Get Healthy initiative, uh, they also came with the Move with the Mayor initiative. So they started telling me their ideas around this. And so I started doing my own personal evaluation on my health and um, realized, you know, that I was on the scale of obesity 
and uh, that I needed to make some changes. Although, as I shared with you, I'm a pescatarian, been one for about 15 years now. Uh, I never saw a McDonald's french fry that I didn't like. <laughs> so those potatoes were putting on the pounds, right? And of course, added stress of the you know, leadership and all these different things. So yeah, I, I had, I had uh, gotten up there a little bit. And so I decided that not only would I just talk the talk, but I was gonna walk the walk. So if there was an event, if we were having a move with the mayor event, I was there. I was exercising. I, I think I could still lift my leg like that now. But, um, and so, uh, you know, I, I did bike rides. I did exercises. I did I, my toughest, uh, the toughest thing I did was go to a fourth grade gym class. <laughs> so, you know, you know that? Are you smarter than a fifth grader? It's like, are you as fifth? At fit as a fourth grader? No. <laughs> so I went to a, a, a fourth grade gym class and participated, was, yeah. And I did rock climbing, you name it. If we had an event, I was there. But not only did I do that, I lost 30 pounds in the process. So, uh, so, uh, it, it's, it's, so when, when my community sees me, they know that I'm trying to lead by example. Uh, you know, I could go to a hotel and they'll say, oh, we know you don't eat this, you know, and so, uh, <laughs> so it, it, it has been. That's why I love the fact that um, we have our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative. And for me, it's, you know, looking out for the physical, mental, and spiritual aspect of a person. I believe all of them work uh, hand in hand. That's why we have uh, a behavioral health advisory board within the uh, mayor's uh, office and works collaboratively with our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative. And I even, uh, because you know my faith is a, a, a strong foundation of who I am, every Wednesday I have started a call uh, for 15 minutes where people can call in and I call it Winning Wednesday's Prayer with the Mayor. And so people call in and I give an inspirational message. Uh, nobody talks but me. Uh, I give an inspirational message, I close with prayer, and everybody goes out and has a winning Wednesday. And so uh, I believe that all of this has been part of the equation for us having a healthier uh, Baton Rouge. And uh, once again, I always have to reiterate that we do not have a health department, but we are doing some amazing work, work um, in health mm -hmm. in our community. So, you know, um, these, these types of efforts and initiatives don't happen, don't just happen by circumstance, right? Um, I said earlier, the previous mayor started this process. Well, structure and process drive outcome. So during the mayoral, you know, can, debates uh, back in 2016, 15, 16, you know, the board of the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative met with each one of the final candidates to talk about the policy roadmap that the city had been on and the parish had been on and to ask those candidates really pointed questions and um, laid the request, said, if elected, will you continue the good work of Healthy BR? Well, the mayor said, yes, not only would I continue it, but I will amplify it. And she has done that. Um, as far as the, the board is concerned. So we would give her a passing grade. As, well, as thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so. You know, and I have to say, um, you know, Colette is asking me the questions, but uh, she's been a key operator with our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative. She was there from the very beginning when it started, before I even became mayor. And her level of commitment and dedication is obvious in the work that we have accomplished. So what do you think it's attributed to our success? Well, I, much like Nurse Brown, you know, being an advocate mm -hmm. to me is I hope I can be just a little bit like her. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am a registered nurse. And so as a nurse working at the bedside, I had the privilege and the opportunity to impact patients um, and their families one at a time. 
And then as a hospital administrator, you know, I had the opportunity and, and the privilege to impact groups of people within our community. Um, you know, one, one decision or, you know, one, one opportunity at a time. But as a nurse advocate, working with the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative, I have the privilege and the opportunity to change whole populations of health, people's health in our community. So that advocacy position is one that is so important that, you know, just want to make sure that every single one of us, it's, it's each individual person brings their gifts and talents to the table, and how do we amplify and use those for the greater common good? I mean, that's what keeps me. It's like as a nurse, we say we're here to make a difference or we want to leave things better than we found it. The opportunities that the Mayor's Healthy City initiatives have provided have allowed me to do that and hope to continue to do that. Well, you've been a cornerstone of our work. Thank you. Well, thank you. We, we want to close with something that we think is really important. The mayor talked about faith, her belief systems being significant to not only her personal life, but the work that we do. Um, and so we want to close with an excerpt from the prayer of Oscar Romero. If you haven't heard the whole prayer, I encourage you to research it and look at the entirety because we're just going to lift out a middle portion of it. And so what we would like to leave you with is, this is what we're about. We plant seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. How is it that each of you are planting seeds in your communities? How are you continuing to water those already planted? And what will you take from this um, Movement of Life Caucus home to lay additional foundations? Thank, Thank you. you. So we do have about seven minutes to be able to take questions and answers. If anyone would like to come to the mic and ask some questions, I do want to re- um, Iterate the making sure you complete your evaluations that'll help us in our next programming and and thank you all. I'm so proud of my community. So yay. So please. Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Vasquez Morgan from LSU Health in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yay! So I am just thrilled um, that you are here because we've been talking at this caucus about the barriers that are political in nature. So as an administrator, I serve as an assistant vice chancellor for institutional wellness, but sometimes our efforts are disjointed because we don't have people like you that are really upholding these things. And so I'm thrilled to see that you've taken this major initiative on and done so well. And you know, for other cities in Louisiana to, to go ahead and move forward with these efforts and help us as clinicians and administrators to help our communities that need this so much. So it's not really a question, but just uh, a comment that I'm just so thankful. So thank, well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's a team effort and it has to be a priority, uh, I would say. And I will tell you that we have shared information with other mayors. Yes across the state and other places in terms of how we, um, our toolkit for addressing the pandemic. Again, oh, no, go ahead, Tamara. Okay, good morning, my name is Tamara Huff. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm actually at Ochsner Clinic Baton Rouge okay. there, so very familiar with the area. But I'm a Georgia native and I love what you're doing and collaboration is key. But following along with what the other physician just said, how do we bring these ideas outside of Louisiana? So if you're looking at being an advocate in your community, if you're working with the mayors in your community who have all these other community, com other interests, meaning dealing with crime, dealing with COVID, dealing with all these other issues, how do we elevate health equity to the forefront of the political spectrum mm -hmm when we're dealing with mayors that have so many other things in their plate. So how do we be that advocate outside of somewhere like Baton Rouge or Louisiana? Thank so you. So I really believe uh, that we are in a season where health equity has elevated and it's the time, if never before, 
to continue that conversation and uh, use the foundation. And let me tell you, it came up because of the pandemic. Health equity came up because of the pandemic. Yes, we were talking about health equity, but when it became obvious through the data that communities of color were not getting what they needed, then you had heightened conversations around health equity. So we have to seize the day, the moment, and continue those conversations. They're still going on. I would say that I have a responsibility too, uh, as a mayor, to uh, continue that conversation on platforms that I'm involved in, like the African American Mayors Association, the National League yes. of Cities, the US Conference of Mayors, uh, making sure, and you're right, mayors have a whole lot on their plate right now, uh, whether it's health equity, whether it's social justice, you know, crime, uh, in, in Louisiana, water management, you know, my people, whenever it rains, they want to close down everything because of flooding. And, you know, they're traumatized by it. So um, it's just a matter of being very intentional about it. Do you have something you want to add, Colette? I would say seek first to understand. Understand what's currently going on in the community because sometimes we only see things from our lens and from the silo that we function in. And so getting outside of that, seeking to understand what's currently going on and then attaching ourselves to what's current affords us the opportunity to be a catalyst to then go to what is needed. And sometimes we want to swing for the fence and say, if we can't get this, then it's not happening. And social change tells us we're much more effective. We can start at the bottom and grow our way up and scale to what needs to be done. So seek first to understand and then join where you can to then to scale. Leave it to Dr. Huff to steal part of my thunder. Uh, I have a similar two-part question, and thank you. Introduce yourself, Willis. Uh, I'm Reverend Willis Steele, uh, pastor of Cam uh, Faith Mission Baptist Church in Camarillo, but I'm also an advocate in the community for HIV and AIDS uh, and musculoskeletal health. And I, both of you have done a great job in what you presented. My query is simply, how have you been able, or, or have other cities, this is part of what um, Dr. Huff asked, looked at what you're doing. Uh, we have a representative from Philadelphia Fight here, one of the largest, most comprehensive HIV AIDS care centers in the country based in Philadelphia. So your model is phenomenal because you brought the numbers way down from one to 10. And then secondly, um, how, how, how do you connect what you're doing to movement in your community for these HIV AIDS patients in particular, because they have a lot of comorbid issues. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious if any of that's happened in your space. That's a very comprehensive uh, question, Pastor. I'm gonna, do my best to, <laughs> I'm gonna do my best to answer it. I got a lot on this hard drive these days. Okay, okay. But uh, let's, let's, let's start off with the mayors, um, uh, other elected. So I have uh, shared our information primarily with mayors in the state of Louisiana. Like I immediately had my team draw up a plan of action for other cities who wanted to address specifically uh, the pandemic. Um, I will tell you, uh, I think you're offering a challenge in part of your question because we really, when it comes to, though we have reduced the number um, of uh, HIV and AIDS, we still, I think, need to improve when you talk about the morbidity and uh, the need to increase movement there. I think we need to, to lean into that a little bit more. As I said, now I, I will tell you this, advocates in our HIV and AIDS community, they're at the table in the work that we do. So um, uh, they are very much a part of what we do and, uh, but I think we need to probably do a little bit more in that area. I think there was one other thing you asked. Did I cover it? No, you, you actually okay. encapsulated it well. Thank you. Well, we want to thank you all. Please help me. 30 seconds. 